Welcome to the show. We hope you have a blast. Thanks for making time for the Dealer Talk Podcast. Another business leader, here's a penny for your thoughts. This ain't a regular conversation, baby. This that Dealer Talk. Yeah. What up? Welcome to another episode of the Dealer Talk Podcast. This is your host, Herb Anderson. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let me check in with my co-host, Miss Charity Ann. Woo! What's up, Charity? How are you? What is up? Was that? Did that sound like a boo or like a woo woo? You know, it makes makes a difference on the presentation. Are you clarifying right now? That was a woo hoo, and not it was a woo woo. I just didn't want it to sound like a boo. You know, I was. Oh, we're yeah. booing me. Things were, were you booing me? Oh my gosh! No, not at all. I'm just saying, like that was just a. I'm hurt. Um. Why? I'm clarifying it for a reason. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> On, How you doing, kid? What's going on? What's up? Nothing much. Just working life and cars. So you just got back from a vacation. We didn't have an episode last week, and it's all Charity's fault. Yeah, blame it on me. Um, I did. How, how I just it? got back. It was great. It was great. I was sunburnt. I... It was great. Am I allowed to say I drink a lot? Yeah, we can say by 11 a.m. Dude, it's our <laughs> show. We can say whatever we want. Laid on a beach. Very cool. So um, what was the best thing you did while you were on vacation? Pick one experience that you did that was above all else and share okay. with us. I went to this beach. And... A gorgeous beach, right? And we get off the boat, wow. we jump in the water, and everything underneath is just rocks. And you're like, oh, come on. I just paid all this money to go to this beach, and then it's just rocks underneath the water. But wait, so, you don't have, like, water shoes? No. Oh, okay. Water shoes you're, are for, like, you're a rookie. old men. No, dude. Whenever you travel and you go to a beach somewhere, you always bring water shoes. That's rule number one. Why? Because of that same thing. You don't know. You don't know. Well, if it's yeah, but wait. Be... It gets good. So tiptoe across all of the rocks to the beach. And then we're laying on the, on the beach itself. And I start realizing that they're not rocks at all. They're shells. Full-sized, massive, like 10-pound shells just everywhere. So everywhere. It was amazing. I loved it so much. And then, of course, I love to like pick at rocks and collect rocks. And so I spent the rest of the time that I was at the beach just picking through shells like a nerd. Right on. Very cool. Well, I'm glad that you went and uh, you had a, um, a good time. I did. Water shoes? How are you supposed to experience anything with your toes? When you, whenever okay, so I've learned this a long time ago. Whenever you travel to an island somewhere and it's a beach vacation, always always bring water shoes because you don't know. I mean, people think of a beach and they think it's going to be like, you know, sand and perfect, and you just don't know what's under the water, dude. And then you're going to have a bad experience. And if you have water shoes, it solves all of that. So anyway, you were such an old man. Sometimes that's my tip. That's my tip for everybody thinking about taking a tropical or beach vacation. <laughs> Bring some so shoes. I have some actually. You want to see? Oh, that you brought that from there, huh? No, right because that would mean that I had to take it through customs. And Oh, they're going to come. That. They're going to come get you. <laughs> All right. So let's get into it. It's going to be a great episode. We, we are going to be talking to an amazing guest about... I mean, we're going to see where the conversation goes, but I suspect um, modern retailing is going to be a big part of the conversation. Um, before we uh, introduce our guest, um, let's get into some automotive news. Automotive news. Um, we didn't have our podcast last week, which was a tragedy because there was the best little bit of automotive news coming out of Detroit. 
they released a new Ford Mustang that is like all of the discussions that we've had about muscle cars and EVs and Ford was like, they were making a statement with this vehicle and I want one now. It's pretty impressive. I'm not going to go into all of the details about it because I will probably sound like an idiot, but go check it out. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Speaking of sounding like an idiot, I've listened to some of these past episodes and it's like, oh man, I said that. And, but I meant this other thing, but I hope the audience understood that I, you know, English is my second language. So I'm making a lot of those mistakes as of late. I've been talking a lot of Spanish at my house, you okay, know, nice. so um, forgive me. You, you all know I mean well. I mean well. So, um, okay. Uh, what else? So I have a statistic for you. I'm pulling it up. Um, an article came out about the Gen Z. Um, the article title is Gen Z buyers aren't that different from you and me. And it had some really interesting statistics in it. Data collected from CDK Global Automotive Analytics and Consulting Company says that um, teens and 20 year old buyers. I like to make you guess these things. Do you know what the percentage of teens and automo and 20 year old buyers are that complete their purchase online? Ooh, 60%. 13. 13%? Oh 87% of these buyers um, complete their purchase at the dealership. See, and we're, we're I, and everybody's freaking out about digital retail and stuff, which I know we have to do. I know it's the future, but, and, and they call our industry slow, right? Like, come on, like we're every, everybody in the industry is scrambling to figure this thing out. And the consumer's like, ah, yeah, I, I'd rather go into the store. Yeah. And it says 80% of those polled said that the most important element was the ability to take their time and understand their options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like it, it, a thought came when you were saying that with VR. And I wonder how much of a push, two things. I wonder how much of, of, a, of a VR test drive experience we're going to, we're going to, we're going to see in the future. And number two, I wonder if it be, if it becomes available and it's um, realistic enough, if that will have, well, I mean, I'm sure it will have, but you know, how much of an impact will that have on people on deterring customers from going to the dealership? Cause I've said it on the show many times, like me personally and my group of, and I'm not a Gen Z, but whatever, like I'm just saying like my circle of friends that I've, kind of interviewed throughout the years, like none of us, like I've never had one person say, yeah, like I would buy that car online or, Hey, guess what? I just bought a new car on Carvana or right. um, I've never, anybody has ever said that one time. Like it's never happened to me. Right. So, and then the argument being, well, that's because you're older and that's the way you've always done it. This new generation. And you've said this before, the new generation, they're used to buying everything online. So that's what they're going to do. And this article is saying that that's not really actually true. That's not it, really happening. Yeah, that's not happening like at all. And then it did go on to say that the biggest, the most common issue reported by Gen Z buyers was they spend an average of 17 hours shopping online. And then they come into the dealership and then they have to do it all over again. Okay. So, so let clarification, like I've never said, well, maybe I have, so I'm not going to say never, but typically I refer to as my kids, right? Like I think my kids will want to buy with the click of a button because they're, they, you know, my, my son is 11 and my daughter's 15. So they're, you know, well, maybe not so much my daughter, but they've, they've, you know, they've grown up in the, in the Amazon age, right? So they, you click and you buy, not that they've experienced it as buyers because they're not the one buying stuff, but they know that you buy stuff online and it just gets delivered to the house. So, um, I think, you know, I think future generations, of course, are going to be more prone to want to have those types of experiences. So right. plus there's a, but you also me, have to remember that this generation, like, maybe as they get older, but right now they've never bought a car before. Right. 
And so they don't even really know how to do it. And so buying it online can probably seem quite intimidating. True. There's there's that element too. And 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 for me, there's a nostalgia attached to the in-store experience because I remember, you know, my I think I mentioned on the show, my dad, my 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 grandfather used to be a driver for for uh, exec an executive at Ford Motor Company. And my dad was an engineer there, and um, they were just big, you know, buy forward, you know, that that sort of mentality. It was it was dinner dinner topic conversation when I was a, when I was a kid, and then um, I, there's just a lot of nostalgia attached to going to the dealerships. I remember my dad taking me to dealerships, not just to buy a car, but just to go and you know, like experience it and look at look at vehicles. And and he was one of those guys that. He would build these products, but then he would like to go and see the the finished product out in the in the market. And that's um, interesting. I would never attach the word nostalgia to a car dealership. In my yeah, but I mean, for me, there's a lot of that because I remember going with my dad, and I remember um, I remember those those experiences. I remember going to the Ford plant and riding in those cars that they have in there. One time, me and my brother fell off of one, and one when I it was hilarious my dad kept going and we're like on the ground like and then all of a sudden he must have realized that after and came back looking for us and we're just like oh like still on the floor but so there I, there's just a lot of you know there's that element you know my dad since passed so there's that element of you know just my childhood and i know a lot of people are not associated with that but still you did go into the dealership with your parents if you're in my age bracket and there's, you know, you, that's how you were kind of trained without even realizing it. So, um, see, but I wasn't at all like, so that entirely different experience. The first time I bought a car, well, my, my ex-husband and I bought a car together. And I think that I'm trying to think of like, my brother used to sell cars when I was a teenager. So I went, that was probably the first time I'd ever been in a dealership where I was 17 years old yeah of, yeah so i don't i didn't buy a car my first car that i ever bought i bought when i worked at a dealership right on well i mean you know we all have different different experiences i think that for a lot of folks you know that went with their parents or that even just for the service and they were there and they had the popcorn and stuff like there's all those you know just all those memories that you attach kind of like the 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 happy meal um situation yeah. right so situation yeah <laughs> what was your first car um i had a ford escort ford escort ford escort yeah so fun stuff mm -hmm. i remember i tripped it out i put like rims on it and i put like <laughs> like the lights underneath it so you Turn this button in, and it like gets fluorescent at the bottom. I thought I had like a, like a souped up. <laughs> yeah, it's like that, like that scene from Horrible Bosses where the guys like you drag race in a Prius, and the guys like, yeah, I don't win a lot. <laughs> so I had like all these wheels, NK wheels, and like lights and all this stuff, and um, yeah. Then it was an escort. You look back on those days, and you're like. No Nas too. So, <laughs> all right. Um, what else you got? One more. Toyota just they closed their plant in Russia with plans to liquidate and um, suspended production in the Saint Per Saint, bleh, suspended production in Saint Petersburg. They had suspended. I'm dying here. Suspended production in March due to supply chain disruptions. And they have announced, this was like two hours ago, that they are completely closing the plant and will probably liquidate it. And they did it now so that they could, because they had enough, so that they could offer severance packages or whatever they're called. But, but why are they doing it? It doesn't really say. It's a very short article. It implies 
that it's because of everything that's going on with Russia and Ukraine. But Toyota, in the articles that I was reading, because I was looking for that, they don't distinctly specify that at all. It did say that they are the first Japanese manufacturer to leave Russia, though. I mean, that would make sense with Mm -hmm. everything going on. Like, your interests are are compromised, right? So, Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny, somebody mentioned this the other day. Was it, I think it was Steve Powers. He's like, dude, that war is not even in the headlines anymore mm-hmm. and it's still going on. So, yeah. Um, and we thought um, it was going to be like, which is a tragedy, really. I mean, it's yeah. some of the headlines that come out of there, you're like, we should probably be paying more attention to this. Right, right. Um, anyways, yeah. So, um, another one here that going? I, this is kind of like a follow-up to one that we talked about on the last one, but that whole Kia and Hyundai uh, theft situation, like there's 15 class action lawsuits. <laughs> I so, mean. It, here's, uh, a, here's a headline. So it says Kia and Hyundai theft, uh, theft craze triggers an illegal migraine. 15 class action lawsuits have been filed against Hyundai and Kia after online video showed how easy it is to steal some of their vehicles, setting off a frenzy of car theft and creating a headache for the Korean automakers. Dude, what? Like, that's insanity. Like, a frenzy of car thefts does not even 1,500% increase. Like, that's not a frenzy. That's like a freaking... So here are two um, alternative... <laughs> here are two... Is it alternative or ulterior takeaways? One, that's why you got to be on TikTok, dealer. So if you're not using TikTok, you're missing out. And two, don't tell me social media doesn't work. It works. If you have the right content, that shit will work. So (laughs) you have the right content. (laughs) So great content right now would be what to do with your Kia or Hyundai. Yeah, like how to prevent your Kia Hyundai from being. I, I don't know if you. There what aftermarket? I don't know, but I would watch a TikTok about yeah. that. <laughs> but seriously, not, that's not. That's actually no. Getting getting you know, in all seriousness, that's not a bad strategy to have. The, the, or, um, so you know, like if you're a Kia or Hyundai dealer, like get out there and start piggybacking on all this this traffic, right? That th- this post has generated. Like you could take this post that whoever created it and do like clips of it and be like, okay, here's what you, and you insert that into your Mm -hmm. post and dude, you're going to get like tons of views and stuff for your, for your store and for your brand and for your people. And, um, you know, you can definitely create a lot of attention off of that. So. Yeah. You You could just have like your service manager go, Hey, you stressed out about your Kia? Come on in. And so if you're a Kia dealer out there and you wanna you wanna get a strategy in place, give me a call. Um, this brings up kind of an interesting story. When I used to live in Phoenix years ago, and we had problems with car thefts um, frequently. Like we had a motorcycle. I think our motorcycle got stolen three times. Um, Car thefts are have a really high rate of return because people, when they steal a car, they joyride them and then they drop them off and then they pick up another car and then they joyride that one. But if you have like a motorcycle or something, those are more likely to go to a chop shop. Um, and I learned that the hard way. Right on. Yeah, man, this is, uh, you know. Crazy times. A uh, quick, uh, quick shout out here to our our friends over at Lotlinks for the. Oh, look at that! For the swag. Appreciate it. And no charity. They didn't send you one. I know nobody only, gives me anything. Only Actually, that's not true. Shout out to Impel. What did they send you? <laughs> um, I have well, it was spin car, but I've got a backpack that says spin car. Mm-hmm. All right. So here's one that is interesting, if I can find it. But it's also the backpack that goes everywhere with me when I travel. So um well, thank you, Impel as well. And uh 
<laughs> you know, I'll I'll wait to get mine in the mail. <laughs> no, no, so, no. Unless we're equally swagged out, you don't get one. <laughs> <laughs> right on. So here was one about GM um, converting or getting ready to invest. I think it was $60 million into um, converting one of their plants in Michigan for EV, which I How think much? it's 60 million, I think was the number. I can't find it anymore, but so don't quote me on that 100%, but I'm pretty sure that was the number that I saw. And it's really, that's really interesting and super encouraging because I, you know, they're one of the, the brands that have made these bold statements. And so now is the time to, you know, act. And that's going to require heavy, heavy investments. So, you know, good for them that they're, you know, they're not just saying stuff, but they're, they're going to work, trying to make it happen. And then they're, they're, um, I've been seeing a lot of posts and been having a lot of conversations with uh, GM employees about this, um, the Equinox, the electric Equinox. I think it has a $30,000 price range. The so, Jeep Wrangler will be, I was just reading something that said that that would be one of them. Yeah, but it's cool to see that they're, you know, not just compete and come up with an EV model, but do it at a level that is affordable and accessible. Yeah. So that's, um, you know, because that's really going to kind of push the initiative and push the movement forward. So, right. Um, all right. This, I, I haven't seen anything about this, but this is, it's kind of potential news. Obviously we know that there was another, um, uh, interest rate increase, um, yesterday, right? Two days ago. Yeah, so um, my take on that or what, what I want to talk about that is kind of just bring awareness to um, any decision makers tuning in to start focusing on, not that you should ever not focus on, but that's just the way we do it in the industry for some reason. But now is a time to um, start looking at your whole operation, in particular fixed stops, because as we know, fixed stops is always a saving grace when we come into these these situations and I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to be doom and gloom guy here, but it's, it's, it's funny that the day that happened two days later, as I'm doing these, these reviews and um, digital analysis, I saw significant decreases in traffic. Uh, you know, again, we'll, things are yet to be determined, but um, don't wait until you're in a situation where you, you're, you have a complete slowdown of variable activity to start looking at fixed stops and start um, kind of making those moves sooner rather than later. Um, we're we're going to put a, a blog post out there. I think it's next week, Charity, that's going to hit. Yep. Uh, talking about that and with some recommendations. So um, we'll obviously link it into that week's episode. But I just kind of want to start spreading out the, the word out there. And, you know, remember that uh, they're still the mean year right now is 12 plus years, I believe. So that means that people are going to be more inclined to put monies into maintaining and getting their vehicles in tip top shape than they're going to be into trading or potentially getting into a new car. Uh, so, you know, SEO, critically important. And make sure that you have some paid strategies through social and search to be ready. Yes, for sure. Blog post of the week. <laughs> Blog post of the week. Phones, guys. We're talking about phones today. And the something that's near and dear to my heart, but phone skills. We've talked about this on which episode did we talk about it with I mean, Jim? It was Jim Flint. Yes. And how, you know, this generation that's coming in, they don't have the phone skills that we were raised with. And that creates a whole set of hurdles to overcome when you begin training on the phones. And one of the most important things I think that we can do is to just be cognizant of the fact that 
you have to do that. You can't just go in and tell a bunch of employees, go make some phone calls because you're not going to get the success and the conversion rates that you need. There's a statistic out there that says three or uh, you have to ask for an appointment three times um, before somebody will say yes. 60% of people say no three times before they say yes. Um, and we don't do that on the phones. And those skill sets, you, I mean, look at the 17 hours. They spend 17 hours on the phone, a customer researching, and then they come into 1.4 dealerships under two. Yeah. Right. I, so I love that, that statistic too. How do they do that? Do they just half their body is in, or do they just put their leg inside the store? It's, it's like an average. I know. I'm just anyway. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, okay. Let's just pivot for a second. Averages drive me nuts because that means like the average phone call is three minutes long. Yeah, because most of your phone calls are like 30 seconds long and then the rest of them are 30 minutes long. Right. <laughs> yes. So, but it depends, right? If you're doing outbound, then you're probably going to get a lot of no's and a lot of like, stop calling me. So those are going to be shorter. And then you'll have the that one that's like, oh, yeah, actually, you call me at the perfect time. Right. But those skills, like that's all part of that skill set. You've got to be able to teach people to just push and push and push in a way that isn't offensive to a customer. And that creates um, conversational tools and the nuances of communication. And that's a higher level training skill than what you're starting with right now with your with your agents and even your sales staff. We, you don't realize the amount of body language that you use in a, in a, in a conversation until you pull it away. So an example, I was, when I was on my vacation, one of the people that I ran into really, really sweet girl named Ruth didn't speak any English. And I speak very, very little Spanish, but we communicated just fine for we spent like 12 hours together and we communicated just fine because we use body language to communicate. You pull that away, it's a whole different skill set. It's an entirely different skill set. And that's the higher <laughs> that's the higher level training than what you need to be starting on right now with your agents. Yeah, so I, yeah, first of all, this is an old an old article that we wrote um just at the height, I guess, or at the mm -hmm. at the beginning stages of the pandemic, and um, kind of the premise that I was trying to get across at that point in time was that now is the time to mm -hmm. call your customers, and you have a reason now more than ever to do that. And I think that, and I, you know, me and Charity were talking about, you know, our 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 post for this week, and I really thought that that would be a relevant. Um, kind of uh, information to kind of, you know, get back out there in front of folks, because I think we're in that same position now. Like I think consumer confidence every time that there's these interest rate increases, and I think there's been what, five or something we re I read the other day, maybe three. There's I don't know. I mean, I'm not, don't quote me. And then that. they're going to have five. Yeah. Some, something, something weird like that. Um, but like that. um my point is that consumer that impacts consumer confidence. And there is the reality is, is there there's a lot of things converging right now. One is you have customers that are, um, you know, that are going to potentially they ha they've been waiting to buy because they don't know kind of what's happening. They the cars that they want, they have been there are, are not available. Mm -hmm. They they're probably just interested in getting that specific new car. And they're, they're alternative buyers, but I mean, the choices that they're picking from are slim to none. Two is you have all this decrease in new car activity, which, can, which is going to hit the, the service drive. Like we just haven't seen that yet because we've been lucky enough that because of this whole situation, although for the most sources that I talk to, the RO count is down, but the dollars per RO has increased. So they really haven't felt that impact. But trust me, it takes about 12 months for that to catch up when you sell less new cars that eventually hits your service drive. So we really haven't seen that impact. 
but that's gonna that's coming right because it's in the it's kind of in the pipeline and now if we continue in this economic it, yeah economy uncertainty then that's going to benefit that could potentially have more benefits for service and it can have or for fixed ops than it can have for variable and so you have to be ready for all these things um, and I know I'm, that last statement there I'm kind of speaking from both sides of my mouth but um, because of what's happening in the economy that could actually be beneficial for your service drive and that could delay the impacts that COVID has sort of created or that you're going to see because we felt the the benefits on the variable side immediately and now we're you know and then the imp the impact of that too with um you know the inventory shortage but that stuff is going to trickle into your service drive eventually and you know um i just that's why i wanted to uh kind of um have this information on or or put this piece of information in the in the new section that we talked about earlier that to put some emphasis on your service departments now because it's getting really weird, man. And, you know, typically when this kind of stuff happens, that's when we we reach out to the the service. And now all of a sudden fixed stops becomes like the, the area of focus. Well, um, and then let's go back to then everybody's like, oh, well, we're not seeing the the traffic that we need to see make more phone calls. And and you guys, your teams don't have the skill sets. You got to sit down with them. And the worst thing is if um, <clears throat> if your customer or your customer, if your if your sales associates and your agents aren't bought in to your message, or if they are scared of the interest rate hikes, or they aren't bought into market adjustments, or whatever your strategy is, if your teams aren't convinced that of that sale of that pitch, it comes through on the mm -hmm. phone. For and sure. You have to have that message locked in and you've got to have your teams know how to have a conversation on the phone. It one voice or one message, multiple voices. Yeah. Um, it's going to become, you know, it's not that it's going to become, it is already such an important part of your day-to-day -day operation, but in these situations and slowdowns and uh, potential uncertainty, um, you know, dealers have tremendous opportunity and that they have their, their best, um, um, I don't know if lead source is the right way to look at it, but your best customers, your best, you know, your DMS, man, that those are customers that said yes to you, that continue to say yes to you by servicing their vehicle post-purchase mm -hmm. um, year after year after year. They have an incredible relationship with your service advisors more so than they do with the salespeople. Mm -hmm. And so um, those are things to leverage during these times. And you have a reason now more than ever to reach out to those folks, let them know that, hey, you know, I just wanted to check in with you, make sure that you're doing all right. You know, is there anything that we could do here to, to help you? What, what's your current situation like? Kind of let them tell you what they're, you know, if, they're, if there's anything that you can do for them. You know, like I was talking to somebody yesterday and they, the, the, you know, there was, I don't want to name names here, you know, but I was talking to somebody yesterday and they mentioned that they talked to this customer and this customer was upset because he was going through a divorce and potentially losing his job. And so, you know, this is a, the, 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 these are real things, man, that are happening with your customers. And, you know, um, those are opportunities to step in and help. And by doing that, you can benefit. You know what I mean? You, you never know what, what, what a position that person is in and you call them at the right time. And, yeah, especially nowadays. <clears throat> I remember years ago in a training, I um, I worked for a different dealership and they'd sent me to do some training. And one of the things that just really stuck with me was if you if they hang up on you, it doesn't mean that they hate you. They might just be having a really bad day, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, plus we can't take that stuff personal. And at the end of the day, like, you know, you're 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 there to do a job. And if you're in that in that position, your job is to call people and to get rejection well, and to get phones on the up in your face. My, as a person who's been on the phones most of my career, if they hang up on you, that's the easiest. You're like, oh, thank God. Yeah. All yeah. you did was hang up on me. <laughs>
Right. I've been screamed at. Oof. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, anyway, so. Um, yeah, the phones. We're going to link the article in the show notes. So make sure to check that out. And then we're also going to um, link any any in, uh, these portions here that we talked about the for the news section in the show notes as well. And then if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, make sure to check out the video description um, for all the links. <laughs> Without further ado, it's time to introduce our very special guest, Brian from A to Z Sync. Hello, Brian. How are you today? Well, hey, I'm, d I'm doing great. Thanks for having me today. I appreciate you both. Great. I'm excited for this conversation. Yeah, it's going to be a good one for sure. Um, interestingly enough, I saw a post yesterday with the CEO of your company over at Paragon Honda. I think they're they just launched your your system or your solutions, which I'm excited to talk about. But um, we kick things off here with a intro. So tell us about you. Sure. So my name is Brian Ali. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer for A to Z Sync. And uh, I've been with A to Z for about four years now. I'm a, I'm a convert. So I was in uh, the retail space, oh, for about 15 years, um, automotive retail, and made the switch uh, almost four years ago to the vendor land. So uh, here helping dealers transition uh, their traditional business model to more modern model, whether it be full on single point of contact uh, or a combination of uh, training processes and software. Uh, or just the software to help streamline the online to in-store journey um, with or without a finance manager. Right on. I love that. Super excited to talk about that. We just had, I think it was two episodes ago, we talked with Mr. Duran Cage and got pretty heated and passionate on that session. But <laughs> we talked about the, for me anyway, the, the word experience and how we do such a bad job Um in the industry of delivering on that. And I think one of the one of the ways to achieve that is to have an end-to-end -end person run that operation instead of, you know, moving that customer from, you know, from person to person and having them stay at the dealership for long periods of time. So um, kind of kick it off here, probably there, 50,000. But man, I love the whiteboard back there. That means you guys are getting ready to change the okay, world. You know what? I think you probably walk in any startup and most of that is trying not to screw up the world is, is what's up there. <laughs> right <laughs> on. I like that. But uh, yeah, my, lots of mind melding going on around this place. So pretty cool. Yeah. So um, modern retailing, what does that look like? When you talk, when you say that, what does that, what does that really mean? Yeah, really, it, as far as we're concerned, it's, The customer experience, in our opinion, is the dealer's brand, right? Um, customer loyalty isn't what it once was. Repeat referral business isn't one, what it once was. And some of that happened to us during COVID and mm -hmm. the crazy times the last couple of years. But it's really just about getting back to the customer experience. And, and so we really specialize in the in-store piece. You know, we, we started um, incubating that what that looks like back in 2014 and just creating a better um, car buying experience for consumers. Um, and it's really as simple as that. Uh, yeah. So I've had Ollie Reed on the show a couple times and I remember season one, he was gracious enough to join us and share some of his, uh, some of his success stories at the time he was in that, I don't want to say fight, but he was in the, in that, in that moment where he was being disputed on whether he achieved the record or whatever. And you know, one of the questions obviously that I had for him at the time was like, how do you do it, man? Like, how do you sell that amount of cars with a system that's so fractured or a process that's so fractured? And he said, um, well, I, I don't stay the same way, right? Like every time I, I add units, like I, when you go from 30 cars to 50 cars, you change your process. You go from 50 to 100, you change your process. And I'm always looking at my process. And, and he said, 
now I'm at a point where I do everything myself. Like I have my own assistant. I think Myrna is, is, is that, that person's name. And I know if he's added Carlos to his team and he has more of a, of a different structure now, again, going back to the changing of process. But one of the things that stood out to me at that time uh, was that he was doing everything himself. Like there was no handoff. There was no closer. There was no finance person. There was no delivery person. He did the whole thing. And the mm -hmm. customer stayed with him through that journey. Do you guys believe in that? Do you think that that's, that's the future? Do you think that's a better experience? What, what's your take? Now more than ever, businesses need more efficient sales. That's why thousands of dealerships trust Four Eyes to help with things like automated inventory email updates and ensuring all of your leads get into the CRM. To try Four Eyes for free, visit foureyes.io slash dealer talk. That's foureyes.io slash dealer talk. I think it's a better experience. Um, you have to have, I believe, a different caliber of, of, of people, right? I mean, <laughs> Ali is uh, obviously the cream of the crop. And so, you know, when we work with dealers, the very first thing we do, if they have aspirations to switch over to a, a single point of contact model, the first thing we do is understand who are your people. Right. I mm -hmm. mean, culture eats process for breakfast. Right. Is good old. Oh, I like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's true. Right. It's um, so we always have to start off with who are your people? And you, you'd be surprised to learn that if, if I ask the hypothetical question, um, you know, let's say in a demo on a Zoom call or something. And I say, you know, out of the, the 15 salespeople you have in your store, how many do you think could actually sell a car from start to finish? And almost always it's 10, maybe 15% on the high side, right? And that might be true, but what tends to happen is dealers underestimate the ability of their salespeople. And so it takes, you know, outsiders to come in who can see, you know, the trees in the forest and, and get to understand what's the skill set. So mm -hmm. um, to answer your question, I think it's a better way as long as you have the right people doing it with the right intentions from a holistic point of view. And so we help supply the software that keeps, we call it bumper bowling for salespeople. <laughs> so it, it's a software system that helps keep salespeople on the right path, even if they're, they've never sold a car, let alone sold finance products. And so our system helps keep folks compliant and helps them stay on a path, but, it, but people still buy from people. We gotta figure out how to make sure that people are trained up and level up so that when they meet with clients, we're, we're making better impressions. What is the culture? What does that culture look like for a store in order to be able to have this, not just philosophy, but this approach effectively? What would that, what would that look like? Yeah. Well, certainly buy-in is, is, I'm so tired of that term, but, but buy-in is really important from the top down, right? Now I could have a dealer principal who hasn't been on the showroom floor in 30 years and they think this is the greatest idea ever. And then we sign contracts, we get in the store and the managers aren't bought in, the sales people aren't bought in. And I'll tell you that if the middle managers, the, the guys and gals who are in the trenches making deals happen, if they're not bought in, it's not gonna work. I don't care what the software is or the training that we incorporated, that sunburn will fade real quick and, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a recipe for disaster. So what the, the right culture is, buy-in is number one. I mean, we have to have an unwavering commitment that we're not going to just try this thing out and see, you know, if it works, um, you know, let's do the heavy lifting together. We got your back as, as an advisor during those processes, but we just need your commitment. So if we have that, that that's building block number one. Um, and then I would say number two is there's a switch in mindset that has to happen specifically for sales managers, desk managers who then become more coaches behind the scenes, right? So they're coaching the plays on the field as they're happening. They're not the ones playing on the field. They're coaching from the sidelines. And so they have to make the transition from being overly involved in looking at one transaction at a time and looking at them, considering they're orchestrators of, a, of the band playing music, but they're not playing the instruments. And they're coaching salespeople, you know, at different points along the way. So managers don't go away. They're involved. They're just more behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Right, And so if, if we have that, the third pillar, I, I think, for success, not that I think, but the dealers that are doing this at the, at the highest level 
they create a culture of training. So when you're not selling and you're not following up and you're not eating lunch, you all are training, role playing, drill practice, rehearse. And, and that is the, um, the be all end all. So whether this works or, or any anyway. other change, right? Yeah. Yeah. I talk about that often here on the show. I always say like, we have these grandiose expectations for our, mm -hmm. in particular for our sales staff and in, in this industry, but we provide them no training. It's the most backwards philosophy and way of thinking I've ever seen in my life. It's like, dude, and I, I've said this so many times, and I'm about to say it again. Like, you wouldn't expect like the Lakers, right, to go out there and win, and they practice zero times. Well, and then you know, it's just yeah. crazy. And then, and then we punish them for it. Right. Exactly. And it. then it's like, oh yeah, you you suck. Well. um, you know, like, what do right, you expect? Right, and it, well, that was, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say I was guilty of that early in my career. You know, I remember the days where a salesperson would bring you a deal jacket, and if it wasn't accurate, you know, they'll quickly find the, you know, the papers in the office or <laughs> fall into the Yeah, right, like, exactly. No, Get no, out no, of my no, office. No, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's just, you know, it's, uh, we have to change. We have to adapt, right? If we if we don't adapt here, we're we're um, we're dying, right? So I, I think times have changed, and um, we put so much pressure on the salespeople that it's their fault. And frankly, you know, leaders, we got to look at, at ourselves in the mirror and say, what have we done to set them up for success? And and so, yeah. I was going to say, and here's what's crazy with that. When you do that, though, when you do focus and when you do invest and when you do show them that you care and you're invested in their professional growth, you have a better outcome. You have a better employee. You have a more bought in employee. You have somebody that's loyal. You have somebody that's going to be making more money because they're more effective at their job. Right. And so there's just wins all across the board. I just don't know why we why we we just know don't and i'm i'm generalizing of course there's some great stories out there like the paragons of the world that um are super bought into that and they have great leadership and you know and there's many examples like that in the industry as well but i just feel like you know oftentimes there's the you know here's a phone book good luck uh and it's just you know of course you're sending and then nobody nobody asks questions if they if if you're going to throw the papers back at them, they're not learning. They're not learning. They're not going to ask you questions. They're not going to, they're going to come to their own assumptions and their own conclusions. And then if they do have questions, they're going to go to the guy next door to them. Who's probably got six months more training than they do. And you're like, it's the blind leading the blind at that point, because you haven't brokered a re leadership relationship of trust and, security and asking questions you're so right and um you know, i would i would say 75 percent of what we do here at our tech company is we're constantly refining our training um and creating you know explaining the why behind each step in the sale each step in the process and some of the stuff that we did 15 years ago is still relevant which is to your, your the point you just made is you know what is it about that honda accord that interests you um, how are you going to be using the vehicle? What's important to you? And, you know, just asking those open-ended questions and then coming up with a diagnosis and, and which car should be their next car. So we spend a majority of our time on that because the fact of the matter is if the people who are using this, the widget aren't trained, it just becomes another unused widget that the dealer forgot they're paying mm -hmm. for. And so it's really important that we find our way back to the human being that, you know, as everybody's chasing this online journey, and yes, there's a, a small percentage of people who are buying if they can online and would prefer to buy online if, if it was an option. But right now, 90% of the people are still going in the store. They're, they're mm -hmm. still either consummating the deal in the store. Um, maybe they start online and they end up in store. But either way, they end up in store and a human needs to help walk them through some things to get them down the road. And how you do that is so important um mm -hmm. you know it's every car that's being sold in america the last year it, it, the customers aren't buying from the dealership because they have the most inventory or they've been in business for 100 years uh or, or because they believe in you know family or they bought it because you have the car mm -hmm. so it's like what, right. what, 
what do you kind of do to keep them coming back to the service department? You create an experience that makes them want to come back and buy another car from you when things normalize. And, and so the dealers like Paragon, you, you mentioned a couple of times, the dealers that are that are doing what they can to stay on top, you know, getting getting to the top is hard, but staying there is even harder, as they say. And you know, Paragon, as good as they are, they're they're not resting. They're constantly trying to find ways that they can improve the experience for their sales teams which means improving the experience for for the uh, customers and so those are the deals we're, we're working with today yeah i i suspect we're going to see more and more of this i mean it truly is when you talk about an experience i mean talk about something that a customer is not going to be expecting at all and it's going to throw them for a loop in a good way how do you think this ses this system or the setup of a of a one person deal you know, front to back, soup to nuts, however you want to look at it. How do you how do you think that fits in the current landscape? Yeah, I, I think that um, the current landscape, there's a lot of fear, right? And rightfully so, because dealers are, have been very, very profitable and fortunate that there's really no need to change. And so it's, and when I say no need to change from their perspective, there's no need to change. Um, and, and so it's, the waters are murky uh, as, as far as how, how that fits in. But I think that regardless of the climate, the market, economic conditions, people want a good experience when they buy something that happens to be the second or the most expensive thing they've ever purchased. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for the I heard a quote the other day that said, <clears throat> um, no, I forgot what it said. It said, the most dangerous words in the human language are, that's the way we've always done it. Mm. Oh yeah, I mean, talk about a growth killer, right? Seriously. If you just mm -hmm. focus on the way that you've always done things, there's there's no room for for anything else. Yeah, it was, and um, right now, you can't say that. No, because it won't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, forget about it. Um, Brian, what about? Is, sorry, how does this, another way I heard a uh, status quo was. Um, status quo is another way of saying the fine mess we're in. I just heard that one the other day. Uh, sorry, cool. sorry, go ahead. No, it's fine. What about the consumer? How do you how do you think this process fits within the consumer? Oh God, they love it. I mean, if, if there's any reason to do this, aside from the fact that you increase your capacity to sell more cars because you're literally taking, you know, two or three humans out of the process. That that's the only way we can race to a more fast, efficient way to buy a car is take, take the silos out of it, right? And so you increase your capacity to sell more cars. So you give two, hour, two hours back on average to every employee in your dealership who touches a transaction. And the customer loves it because it takes an hour instead of three to five hours to buy a car. So what's there not to love about a more efficient way to, to get them in and out of the dealership as quickly as possible? while still providing a really fun, engaging experience. Yeah, dude, so I was talking about, again, I'm, I'm, I'm referencing that episode with Duran Cage, but dude, I said, we're focused on selling the car online and doing all these things and competing with Carvana. Why instead of focusing on that stuff, why don't we just focus on, on going from four hours on average, I think that's the average right now, or five hours. Why don't we go from four hours down to three hours? Let's make that the goal. And then from three to two and two to one, why don't, why aren't we focusing on that? Don't you think that the customer is going to appreciate that more than putting these widgets and these things and creating these, these, uh, um, non processes, because that's what we're doing. Cause digital retailing isn't a, a Carvana competitor. It's just, you know, it's just a lead widget that causes friction and it has all kinds of issues because there's no human involved in that, in that, in that process. Why don't we just focus on that and making that reducing that time? Isn't that a better strategy to be like, hey, you can buy your car online at Carvana, but you can come to my store and have the in-person experience and be out of here in an hour or your car's free or you'll get, you know, whatever, whatever you're willing to put on the line. If you can, you know, if you can. I don't your know. car is free. I want that well, one. Well, whatever. You know what I'm saying? I'm just, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a long shot. But uh, I'm just saying like, it just like. That to me, that's a better uh, use of resources time. It's a true differentiator. Uh, it just has a lot more more value than trying to offer a shitty experience online that isn't really a, an, an experience. Exactly. So, 
Yeah, I was um, so I, I was in Philly for the Automotive City of the Union, um, and I was on. I was there with uh, Duran. He's a good guy, and uh, you know, we were. I was doing some research before my my little workshop, and um, you know, Generation Z buyers, um, you know, they're they're coming up. I think it's they're born between the ages of ninety five and like two thousand twelve or something like that. And you know what they're they're actually showing signs of wanting more hand holding. And they, they actually are more likely to come in the store for the experience, that intrinsic, like, touch it, feel it, experience it. Um, while millennials- We just talked about it during our news section before. That's why Charity and I are alive. Literally. Like, oh, really? It's like 87% rather go and do it in, in yeah, store yeah. than, yeah. Yeah, it's insane, right? And so it's like, okay, well, we can't treat the market as like this one lump sum that everybody wants the same experience. Because then, you know, the article I read right before that from millennials was, look, we would rather save the three hours and click 10 boxes so we can buy a car. Mm -hmm. But I'm not convinced that it's that they don't want to come to the store. It's just that they don't want to spend three hours in the store. Who doesn't want to experience the new car, the, the, the smell, the, the experience, the drive? And that's That should be fun, right? It's just that dealers, we've done it to ourselves. We've made it a really crappy experience, right? Yeah. And so why wouldn't they want to buy online? You know um, what the worst part of that experience is? Sorry to cut you off, but it, just when you said that, I, I went back to my days before I was in the industry buying a car. The, you're excited, right? You're excited to get into your new car, the new car smell. You're excited to drive, and you're just waiting there. And you're like, every time somebody walks out of the office that you know you need to go in to sign the paper so you can get in your car you're like okay it's my turn and then it's not and you're like oh i just want to get in my car you know because everything prior to that is fun right the the test driving yes this is the car the selection part yeah oh you know you're negotiating oh i'm actually going to make this deal happen you know what i mean like all that stuff is is good and then the waiting starts and you're like Oh my God, I just want to get out of here. Yeah, exactly right. What's funny about that is that I just bought a car. It's what, three, four weeks ago. And the finance guy, I, I went in there and he's like, okay, sit down. Now look at all these papers. I'm like, whatever, whatever. It's just freaking show me where to sign. Like, I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and if I'm doing that, yeah, of course the customers are doing that. So it's just like it's, it's, that redundancy in, in the process is it creates and the, the it creates too much friction. And it creates and it, it, it exposes us, you know, from a legal standpoint, from like, you know, people looking into the industry and like, what was it that we, we reviewed the, um, the FTC, the FTC, right. And, you know, like we were, we were, if it was a blatant attack to the industry, but we create that because we expose ourselves by, by having those practices, you know what I mean? And, and setting those right. things up. Because then the FTC was accusing, was saying that um, the amount of time that it takes to buy a car creates. Buyer um, fatigue. Buyer yeah. fatigue. So. And um, then they'll just yeah. sign whatever the hell to get done with it. You know, and salespeople, I refer to it as um, sales endurance, right? They run out of endurance too. I mean, they have to babysit the customer and make sure that when they come out of the box that, you know, they greet the customer with a temp tag or whatever their process is. And it, it just, it, it's tough for everybody, right? Or and the anxiety. They, they have anxiety because they feel like, dude, if this customer doesn't go in, then I'm going to lose the deal, right? And so right. that th there's there's that whole part of it too that we never talk about but it's it's a reality yeah, for a lot of yeah, these sales it really is. and i you know we work with a lot of dealers and <clears throat> i talk to a lot of dealers and we're not for everybody but you know, we do have a solution where you, you can keep your traditional business model with finance managers and our system will help you know um communicate the front to the back end of the process but um regards to the system it's like I, i'm just i'm baffled when i go to dealership in the, the back of the house is paid one way, the front of the house is paid another way. The poor salesperson is just a pawn between those two, you know, mm -hmm. um, touch points. And the customer has no idea what's going on. And we forget that, don't we all work for the same company? And right. uh, so, so even if we, even if one person wasn't the solution for, for dealers today, 
but there's a lot that can be done to help speed up and increase efficiencies and create a better culture back to that culture piece that makes it more enjoyable for people to sell cars and then customers experience that you know that feeling as well if the salesperson's had a bad day because the finance manager the sales manager you know slapping behind you know upside the head before they went out to the customer their customer they feel that that there's something off right so there's just a lot there's a lot of things that are controllable that we can work towards but we're so focused on you know, using salespeople and in and customers as a commodity to make the money instead of leveraging and empowering the people that are in our care in the dealership and then the customer has a better experience as a result so uh, you, you you said something like there that. yeah you said something there that i want to explore because um i just think that um it's not that we don't cover yeah i guess it is that we don't talk a, a lot about that but having the system or not even having the system but how does it impact the level of salespeople or salesmanship that exists within your store and let me let me let me explore that a little bit deeper like in essence how how you know if you were to do this end to end process right what kind of what's the level of salesperson that is that fits in here is this for anybody like i just got into the car business today and i'm going to go through this process and they're going to train me from a green pea in the system or do you still have to kind of you know crawl walk and run into this position a la ali rita where he you know got to a certain level and then he talked he was able to talk to his dps and they were like okay we'll try the system and see how it works like how is that you know, and, and there's more to that, but let, let's, you know, I kind of want to start there and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask the second piece. Yeah, it's that. actually a great topic. And I, I think this environment, it's, um, it allows a, a variety of personalities and skill sets to, to win. Um, but one thing that I, I talk to dealers about, we see it time and time again, is that when you create an environment where it's more of a, an enriched job experience, and it's not just about, you know, can you fog a mirror? Do you have a pulse? Go sell me some cars. And they make it about, there's a there's actually a career path. There's, uh, you have more responsibility. You can actually attract, you can cast a wider net when it comes to acquiring talent and you can get a different type of person in. I, um, you know, when I was in the dealership, uh, gosh, I don't know, it probably hired a couple hundred salespeople over the years, right? In different stores. And it got to the point where I, if I'm out having dinner um, and I have a really great experience from a waiter or waitress and they're knocking my socks off, they're greeting me, they're enthusiastic, they know their stuff, they, they're thoughtful, they go above and beyond. I'm trying to get them to come work at the car dealership because yeah. you show me somebody who's, who's enthusiastic. You know, if there's one characteristic, in my opinion, that wins in this environment, specifically one person is, enthusiasm willingness to to follow a process um and uh show up with a with a great attitude and i'm telling you like they're the best uh at this business because they they're not overthinking things they're not seasoned to where the overthinking they're prejudging the customer they're counting their commissions before they sell the car they just jump in and they love to help customers out and they end up making a bunch of money so they, they are the ones that tend to have the highest finance PBR. I know it's counterintuitive and whoever might be listening to this, they're, they're probably thinking, oh yeah, no way. You're not gonna win against my seasoned finance manager. And I thought that too. Um, but you should, again, somebody with enthusiasm, willing to follow a process um, and truly enjoy working with customers. What happens is the customer ends up going, hey, what do you think I should buy? Because they've earned that trust, mm -hmm. they've earned that ability. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we're coming back full circle. It, it, it changes the way you go to market to try and get talent. You're no longer held hostage to you know, the 20-year the veteran who's going from dealership to dealership to dealership to see which grass is greener. You can bring in people at a younger age. You can bring in millennials so that they're selling to millennials. You can career path them. They're your future managers, GSMs, and GMs. And I, I've, just, I've seen it time and time again. Yeah, I mean, there's that saying, right, that the grass is green on the other side, but the grass is greener where you water it, man. 
Like yeah, if that. you stay in your in your lane and you 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 develop and you you're you're loyal to not the not so much the company, but you're loyal to the position and you're loyal to um developing the skills necessary to succeed, mm -hmm. then you know, like you're gonna win. I mean, there's just no way, dude. If there's one thing that's replicatable is success. Because if another person, another human being did it, that's proof right. so, you can do it too. Um, right. Uh, so the, 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 the other part of that question, and you talked about it earlier, you said, um, well, you didn't, I'm paraphrasing, but my takeaway from your comment was we're like islands in the dealership, right? It's not like a cohesive unit. Hey, we're all working on this together, but it's like we're separate islands. And the mm -hmm. only time we cross over is if the other island is on fire and then everybody goes over there to try to like, you know, extinguish it, right? And that's not my quote. That was somebody that I had on the podcast, but back in the early days that said that. Um, so um, shout out to Tim Stockwell. But um, yeah, dude. So is this system, right? Because you have the right person on the right seat of the bus sort of, sort of thing. I assume that salespeople in this role are going to be, are going to make, better compensation they're obviously getting the training so they're just a better um level of salesperson so does that help to and not in all ways but in certain ways kind of bridge the gap does it help it feel like a more cohesive unit working on the same goal and purpose yeah without a doubt so um a couple things on that so number one the salesperson tends to make a little bit more and if you go back to uh i'll use an example it's a guy named ben brailler that we hired Found him at a, at a sushi place. We used to go to, to Hapa um, here in Denver, you know, once or twice a week. And Ben was just a rock star. Waiter, we pulled him in. I was at the BMW store and pulled him in. And he still to this day is one of the best to ever do it. The guy's making more money than ever he, you know, thought of. And and so you bring somebody in like that, um, and you know, they're gonna make just a little bit more money. You know, they're not coming in needing to make 150, 200 you know like maybe a finance manager would right they're like hey, i just went from making 50 and all of a sudden they're making 75 and they're happy as can be um so you pay a little bit more to the salesperson i would say on average you're paying out about five to six hundred bucks per car all in right let's say again narnia you have everybody in your store is doing the one person thing sure um, it doesn't have to, you can do a hybrid version of this too by the way but if you did that you're paying out about five six hundred bucks per transaction all in and um, you know they're making a, a healthy living, and they're they're fine with it. So you're you're taking money out of you know you're taking some money out of the expense column, you're distributing that and paying the salespeople a little bit more. And what tends to happen? Let's say you had a salesperson that you know was there before and after, um, and the before they're selling on average ten to twelve cars. We'll see an uptick of about two to three cars on average because they have more time on their hands mm -hmm. they're not waiting around for the box to free up and the bottleneck on a saturday for that cycle to go through so that they can say bye to their customer they're having more control of their time and so you can schedule your appointments accordingly and so sell more cars as a result so not only do they, are they making just a little bit more money than they were before because they're redistributing some of that um uh some of the the money but they're able to sell a couple more cars and hits more bonus levels. And they're also making money on the back end. So, um, you know, all in all, it, it, it becomes a pretty efficient way to do business. Right on. Now, yeah, I love it. I, 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 you know, I know I referenced Ali already, but back in those days when we first started, like I think this was four years ago now, I didn't know, right? I was kind of debating um, his approach. And th does this really make sense? Because, you know, the, 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 it was set up like this for a reason. And that reason back in the day, I mean, just for just to get right to it was control, right? We control the whole process from front to back and mm -hmm. customers didn't know any different because they didn't have, we weren't in an efficient marketplace where buyers and sellers have access to the same amount of information. So I get that. Plus at, at one point in, in history, like finance departments weren't big profit centers for dealerships. And they, you know, um, if there's one thing that, DPs and managers and just the dealership community has proven time and time again is that they're entrepreneurs, right? And they're going to find ways to 
make money in all aspects of their operation. Mm -hmm. And so I get that. But I also feel like some of these stores or some of these practices, it feels like we got stuck in times. Yes, these processes have made empires and have made people a lot of money. And it's very hard to question processes that have made you a millionaire. I get that. But times are changing and we have to be able to evolve with that um, you know, with, with, with the market and the industry. And it's, and it's just time for a better experience, yeah. you know, like not just focus on capturing digital traffic and all these other things that we're so quick to jump on, but dude, simple. Like, like I mentioned earlier, let's just cut that time down to two hours. Let's cut it down to an hour. Let's that's, that goes a I don't really know, long maybe way. It's crazy, but, but yeah, no, no, it, it does. Time is the new currency. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we can help customers make more money. We can save them a couple bucks if we want to take price off the car. But when you can create more time in someone's life, I mean, what's that worth? Right. And uh, I used to tell salespeople, they, they get their customer advocates. Right. And they they already said yes to the car. They're ready to roll. And they're just sitting there building more rapport. And I'm like, if you ask 10 customers, 10 out of 10 are going to tell you that I can keep you know, making friends with you, or you can get me out of here because we already found the car. Ten are going to want, hey, I like you. You're great. We're friends, but I got stuff to do. Let me get out of here, right? So <laughs> stop talking past the door. Let's go. Uh, We're buddies, man. I'll give you my cell phone number, and I'll I'll follow you on social media. <laughs> but I need to get out of this place. Sure. Let's have coffee near the day, but can I at least leave today? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, uh, it, it's it's crazy, and, and dealers often – there's this conviction bias that like, if I change what I'm doing today, I'm going to lose money. I know. And the dealers, the dealers we commit to this, like, like going to this type of model or, or it's not, it's not just promoting what, what we do, but if you're making change, you're making change management initiatives in your dealership to provide a better customer experience, whatever that looks like, that doesn't mean you're going to make less money. In fact, across the board, it means you end up doing better. You're either saving money, you're, you're winning because your reviews are better. And by the way, uh, the future of retail is scaling your business because you got dealers that are buying, gobbling up additional rooftops. How are you gonna create processes that are sustainable, that you can systematize, that you can put into new dealerships? And how are you gonna get awarded those dealerships if you don't have a great customer experience? So it's like, all roads lead back to like, we have to adapt the way and change the way we're doing business so that we can future proof tomorrow's problems. And the dealers that are figuring that out right now are uh, gonna be ahead of the, the pack in, you know, in the near future. So I have a question. Do you run into, when you propose this to dealerships, do you, I can only imagine how many people start panicking about job loss. Mm -hmm. Because oh, <laughs> yeah. you're like, whoa, 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 <laughs> Wait I, I, a second. I, I, <laughs> Is that oh, something man, you I run into you a lot of? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That and then some. I mean, you know, when I go to a dealership, I got a big target on my back oftentimes. But but even just in conversation, it, it, yeah, they there's a lot of resistance because, well, change is hard. And um, I think in retail and in sales in general, and I fall in this bucket oftentimes, is we want the six-minute abs, right? We we want the, like, where's my easy button, and I don't want to do the hard work. So there's a lot of fear of, like, the the change initiative is this monstrosity is really difficult, it's, but it actually really isn't if you can find a good partner and somebody who's, you know, got the T-shirt already to help guide you through that. So but to answer your question, yeah, it's... um. It's difficult. There, there's a lot of concerns. It's getting easier, though. I think as as we move forward and there's dealers that do this at a high level, um, dealers love that their next door neighbor dealer is doing it and they've been the guinea pig and they're like, OK, maybe I'll try it. So it is getting a little easier to have the conversations. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is for now, right, because not all dealerships are doing it. Um, it's a differentiator. Right. You can have a different story. You have a different approach. You have a different experience that, you know, that's something you can leverage. So, man, you, man, you smashed that nail on the head, too, because like I was just on with a dealer before I jumped, jumped on with you, just just doing a, a discovery call. Right. Like 
tell me about you guys. I'll tell you about us. Let's see if there's a fit. And we were talking about that. Like, how do we separate ourselves from the competition? And they're trying to figure out how they can gain market share. And I'm like, well, you know, if you create a better experience in your store, this doesn't happen overnight, but over time, you'll mm -hmm. pull in people from other markets. But we've even seen that the average credit score goes up in some, you know, um, uh, certain areas of town, I don't know how to describe it, but that are lower credit scores. We see an increase in the average credit score because you're attracting buyers from outside of your direct market in different zip codes. Right. So that experience is huge. So we went to their website and we talked about their About Us page. They're just asking for my opinion. And I've got a bunch of them like anybody else does. And we're looking at their site and there's really nothing that's captivating in there. It's kind of, it was the same old, like, you know, um, you know we're been in business for this amount of time, family owned. Um, we believe in transparency. Uh, Nobody we, cares. That's yeah, what I know, hear. Customers, <laughs> customers don't even go to that. Are you paid? Right. Look, that's Google Analytics. They're not on your about us page. <laughs> if they are, the, the bounce rate is like a half a second. But, uh, <laughs> but, but but if you can if you can advertise that when you do business with us, like for instance, um, we have some dealers that are one price, one person, one hour. Like as a consumer, and if you if that's on your landing page and it's not the manager special for the month that the customer automatically thinks is bait and switch these days. Right. right? Yeah. Um, it's like, well, what's this one price, one person, one? Oh, so, okay, so you give me your best price out of front. You, uh, once I agree to the car, you give me on an hour, okay, I'll believe when I see it. And um, and one person from start, like, that's different. Now, is that going to get them to come and ultimately buy? Not if you don't have the car, but it certainly sweetens the pot a little bit and makes it a little more intriguing. And then when they come in the store, we do what we call a, a concept conversation. And if that's it, you're selling the sizzle of what makes your dealership different. Not that you have free oil changes and car washes and all this stuff that happens after they buy the car, but mm -hmm. here's how we're gonna make a difference in your life to now. Like right now when you buy the car, we're gonna get you out of here faster. On average, it takes five hours to buy a car out there. You said it earlier. We're gonna get you out of here within an hour after we say yes to the car. I mean, like who doesn't wanna hear that? And then you deliver upon it and you actually- do That's key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's key. We got to be able to deliver on that because that's the most important piece. If you do that, then you have the best form of marketing that exists on planet Earth, right? Okay. Word of mouth. That so, is it, man. And you're, you're same for our little startup here. It's the same for D. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. It. So, that's it. There's nothing better than a dealer talking to a dealer about their experience with us. That's going to sell it more than, than, than this schmuck over here, you know? Yeah. So. <laughs> no, I just, it, that's, I mean, we, we kid ourselves as marketers, like, oh yeah, the strategy and this and the other, but the reality is that marketing moves the needle just enough because if you have good people in process, you can get rid of marketing because a good salesperson isn't going to wait around for a lead. A good salesperson is going to go out there and get it. And then your processes yeah. are going to, are going to, you know, build that experience and loyalty. And so, but you can't do the opposite. You can't have amazing marketing and shitty processes and no person and still sell cars, right? So right, right. Um, yeah, no, that's that's absolutely true. And um, you're gonna have those customers that want to buy it Amazon style, far and few between. We have to take care of them too. I hear that there's a not a mantra, but there's there's a buzz track that's like meet the customer where they're at. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that's true. Like you got to figure out well, what are they gonna accomplish. You don't want to bring the car to you. The days of like get the appointment and get them in, get them in, get them in. I mean, of course, it's always better to get somebody face to face. But why don't you just throw on a camera like we're out here, have a discussion, do a screen share, show them you know what their payments might be, offer to take them the vehicle for a test drive, not because there's COVID, but because you're trying to provide a better service and value, and earn the right to ask for that business. Right. And earn the right to ask for that repeat referral and word of mouth. And um, so that I'm. Really, the dealers that are doing that, it's pretty, it's really cool to see. They're far and few between, unfortunately, at this point, but it's getting bigger and there's there's better dealers out there. For sure. Brian, thank you so much, man, for doing this. We really appreciate it. This has been a really good conversation. Yes. I've, been, I've enjoyed it a lot. And I think there's going to be a lot of little nuggets here that we're going to be able to share with our audience. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is one question that we ask everybody that comes on that sh on the show. I was going to say on that show, on this show. Your show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that question is, where do you see the automotive industry headed in the next five years and why? Hmm. That's a good question. 
In the next five years, I see dealers adapting to the way people want to buy cars, uh, either out of need or force from regulations. I see it uh, increasingly easier to buy cars, sell cars. Uh, and I don't think we have to sacrifice profit as a means to do so. Um, the direct con con the direct to consumer model is certainly not going away. Um, but I believe as resilient as dealers are and always have been, um, we're going to find a way together as an industry to give the consumers what they want and avoid the OEMs from over overstepping into the dealer's territory. Right on. Well, there you have it. Thank you so much again for doing this, sir. Thank My you. Thanks for having me on. Yes, sir. And thank you for tuning in. We really appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today. And as usual, we'll talk later. We only host the well respected. The vendor Lexus Nexus. We don't sell digital marketing. What you do? We inspect it with our DT vendor management. Now more than ever, businesses need more efficient sales. That's why thousands of dealerships trust Four Eyes to help with things like automated inventory email updates and ensuring all of your leads get into the CRM. To try Four Eyes for free, visit foureyes.io slash dealertalk. That's foureyes.io slash dealertalk.